All right, we're going to go through vapor pressure and cavitation kind of from a different perspective. Um, this graphic here is something that appears in your textbook, and it does a nice job of defining what's really meant by a vapor pressure. The idea is that if you've got a, a sort of solid container that's completely sealed like this one here, and you've got a liquid sort of in the bottom of that container, and you put the top of the container... Um, you, you evacuate all of the gases and just make it a complete vacuum. What will happen is that gas will come out of the liquid phase and fill this space above it with the gas phase of that liquid. Okay, And then when this system equilibrates, there will be a pressure of that gas in that space, and that's called the vapor pressure. Okay, so the vapor pressure is sort of the pressure of that um, fluid in the gas phase when it's in equilibrium with the liquid phase at a given uh, temperature. So if we sort of scroll along here, Typically, the vapor pressures are changing as a function of temperature. So right now, I've, I've kind of written here that you know, vapor pressures, which are defined as absolute pressures, um, they're really small at low temperatures. This is supposed to be degrees Celsius here. So when you've got a system that's really cold at zero Celsius, the vapor pressure is just like 0.6 kilopascals, so it's really small. Um, but when you get to um, higher temperatures, the vapor pressure starts going up. So if you thought about a plot of this data, you would see that if you plotted vapor pressure versus temperature, you would see that when temperatures are low, the vapor pressure really sort of starts creeping up slowly. But eventually, if you got up to 100 C, and down here is 0 C, and up here is one, say, one atmosphere, and here is sort of um, zero pressure, that eventually, you get up to 100 degrees, then by the time you're up to 100 degrees Celsius, you've got one atmosphere of pressure, so you're up here. So what's going to happen is you're going to have some sort of a curve like this one, okay? So that means that the vapor pressure is um, really increasing um, quadratically or maybe even exponentially uh, with temperature. I'll also point out here that vapor pressure is always referenced as an absolute pressure. We know that absolute pressure, or P absolute, is always going to be equal to a gauge pressure plus the atmospheric pressure, okay? So the idea is that gauge pressures always just measure the difference between the absolute pressure and what whatever the local atmospheric pressure is. So you see that we have a gauge right here. That um, gauge is measuring the pressure in that tire. But what the gauge is doing is really measuring the difference between the pressure inside this tire and the pressure outside outside the system, okay, because the sensor, whatever that's measuring differences in pressure here, is, is basically positioned between the outside atmosphere and the pressure that's being sort of pushed out of the tires. That's why it's called a gauge pressure. So keep in mind that when you check for cavitation, you want to be checking whether pressures of a system are um, equal to the vapor pressure when both pressures are written in absolute term. So just one example of that, and we'll come to some of this stuff later, but if you were to, say, um, look at a simple tank of liquid, like this one, and suppose we had a, a free surface in that system right about here, okay? And so outside this system, you'd have atmospheric pressure and down here at depth, you would have increasing pressure 
due to the depth of water, we can call that depth, say, h. So way down here, at this location, we'll call it a, the pressure at capital A would be the atmospheric pressure plus um, the density times gravity times the depth, h. Okay. So the absolute pressure at point A is the atmospheric pressure plus rho g h. If you wanted to know the gauge pressure at location A, that would just be equal to rho g h. Okay. So, so gauge pressures always give you the absolute pressure um, minus the atmospheric pressure. Um, before we talked about cavitation, Cav cavitation is going to occur. Um, these vapor pockets um, form when there's a really low pressure um, um, spot in the system where due to that low pressure, the pressure of the, of the liquid starts matching the vapor pressure, so the vapor pockets form. The vapor pockets are transported by the liquid. And I wanted to clarify and just uh, that the process of cavitation technically is a process of those vapor pockets, like this one, hitting a solid surface so, and then collapsing and releasing a ton of energy, which then has the ability to erode away that solid surface. So if we continue on and look at, say, an impeller of a pump over time, if there's cavitation in the pump, this is solid metal here, and this metal is alloys being just um, destroyed by the cavitation bubbles that are, that are hammering home on it. And so where can cavitation occur? It can occur in pumps, like or turbo machinery. It can happen in pipe bends, channel contractions, channel expansions, on rough surfaces, on siphons. If you um, have a siphon, what will happen is that flow can go up and over and out just under gravity from a tank like this. That's the idea of a siphon. But at the top of the siphon here, you have pressures that are less than atmospheric pressure. So it's possible that right up in here, you get a really low pressure, and the pressure is so low that vapor um, comes out of the liquid phase, and that vapor then um, hits a solid wall and, and collapses, and that's called cavitation. You can also get cavitation occurring on the face of a spillway, and that may have been a contributor to um, the collapse of the or Orville spillway um, a couple of years ago. If you pinch a garden hose as water's coming out and there's still flow going through it, you can also cause cavitation to occur, and you'll hear that in the form of like a hissing sound as it comes through the pipe. That's basically what you're hearing is, is the gas bubbles hitting the side of the of the um, of the hose and collapsing. Um, and as I said before, you can have um, uh, damage to pipelines, damage to um, to uh, penstocks that come out of dams. So this is the penstock coming out of the Hoover Dam. And you can see that there's been quite a lot of erosion here and here. Um, the, the dam almost failed. Um, I'm sorry, this is not the Hoover Dam. This is the, <laughs> is this the Hoover Dam? This is the Hoover Dam. And um, there was almost a failure due to cavitation and erosion around the penstock. And it's another photograph of a, of a penstock that had substantial erosion due to cavitation. Uh, and we don't want these bad boys, we don't want these big dams to um, with, so you have pipes inside these systems that are draining from here and bringing the water out. Um, we don't want those pipes breaking and collapsing because if they do, then all the soil that holds up these dams it gets eroded away and you can have a failure of the dam and a, and a total um, disaster downstream with flood damages. So um, that's the summary we're coming to of uh, vapor pressure and cavitation and I uh, hope that helps, helps you out.